Hey, everybody, we are going to talk about some stocks that have fallen in 2024, which has generally been a pretty good year for the stock market, and that we think could be an opportunity to buy now. So Tyler Crow is joining me. We are going to talk about two stocks that we think are kind of bargains right now, and both of them are based outside the U.S. to kind of give you a preview. So before we dive in, please take a minute, check out the link you see on your screen, fool.com slash Frankel. Get the top 10 stocks to buy right now from the Motley Fool. It's the best way to support this work we're doing on YouTube. Again, fool.com slash Frankel. So I'll go first because I know mine's not a, a favorite of Tyler's and is kind of more of a, I would consider it more of a speculative play for me for sure, um, limiting my position size. So I want to be clear right from the get-go. Um, with a lot of these companies that we talk about that you haven't heard too much about, especially some that are cheap for a reason, um, do yourself a favor and limit your position sizes and things like that. If things start going in the right direction, you can revisit, but especially in the beginning, smart to limit your positions on companies like this. Mine is JD.com. Um, there are, and I, there, as Tyler correctly pointed out to me before this video, we recorded this, there are a lot of Chinese stocks that you can look at and say, wow, that's cheap right now. Um, and a lot of it's for a reason. There's a ton of, I mean, I don't want to get into all the political um, you know, aspects of it. There's a lot of political risk involved with investing in Chinese companies. Um, you know, there's a lot, it, it could be a challenging environment. Uh, China's economy is a little bit different than ours, um, especially when it comes to companies like JD.com that have online retail platforms. Um, China, if you're not familiar, had a zero COVID policy until not that long ago. And it was a real benefit for e-commerce companies like JD, like uh, Alibaba, uh, for example. Um, they essentially were only an e-commerce economy for a long time, uh, more so than we were. Um, our e-commerce companies benefited, but we could still generally go to the store and, and shop. Um, not the case over there. So the reason I'm saying that is revenue growth has slowed dramatically in the past couple of years for JD.com. Very tough comparables. Um, you know, 1.2% revenue growth in the latest quarter is nothing to really write home about. Um, really tough uh, comps and things like uh, home appliances and things like that, which were, you know, fueling the business for a while. Um, that was below expectations. Management's been focusing on efficiency lately. Uh, because of that, even though revenue growth only was only about 1%, uh, free cash flow was up by 11% year over year. Operating margins expanded nicely. And this is a remarkably cheap stock. Um, $43 billion market cap as I'm talking. There's $29 billion of cash on the balance sheet. The company is buying back its stock kind of hand over fist right now. They spent They bought back 7% of their outstanding shares in the first half of this year. Um, obviously management sees a good opportunity here. The stock trades for about 10 times earnings right now. And it's not only buying back stock, it's a dividend stock. It has about a 3% dividend yield. There's a lot that can go wrong. I mentioned there's political tensions. There's, you know, we could see further slowdowns. I mentioned they missed revenue expectations right now. Um, so, but all things considered, I think the risk reward looks pretty good right now. Yeah, I opened a very small position in this in JD.com. I would want to reiterate that I'm not putting, you know, 5% of my portfolio into this. This is a small position for me, just one that I think makes a lot of sense right now and that I'm going to be watching closely. Um, Tyler, uh, feel free to bash JD for a second if you want to, or just go ahead and launch into the one that you want to talk about. No, I'll get into mine. Um, I, 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 we're kind of flipping the script a little bit here. Normally, if there's somebody dumpster diving for stocks, it's me. But uh, you decided to to have your hand in at this time. So uh, instead of going to China, I'm going to go to Mexico. Um, this is I, you and I have been talking a lot um, about investing lately, and one of my, I guess you could say, my obsessions, I guess if you will, has been uh, kind of the Mexican stock market specifically, and just kind of the the growth of the Mexican economy in general. There's a lot of sort of uh, catalyst going on between nearshoring, uh, the USMCA trade agreement, and a lot of things that is making it very lucrative to uh, for the Mexican economy right now. And I wanted to I want to focus uh, on this one. It's in English, it's called the Southeast Airport Group. Uh, in Spanish, it's Grupo Aeroportuario del Sureste. I have a very bad Spanish accent. Nobody make fun of me. 
But it's it's an interesting business because basically all the airports in the country are owned by the Mexican government. However, they are leased out on operating leases to about three companies. There's uh, Southeast, there's Pacific, and then there's uh, it's it, it, the ticker is OMAB for the third one. I can't remember the, the name of it. Uh, I think Central North is the is the actual name. But the one I want to focus on is Southeast. Uh, the ticker is ASR on the U.S. exchange. And these businesses are kind of like a combination of a regulated utility and a REIT at the same time because all of the fees that they generate for the you know when a when an airplane lands takes off those are more or less regulated by the Mexican government like how much they can charge depending on the services that are provided you know landing uh using the the jetway boarding bridges overnight parking for your for your airplanes uh, additional security things like that and the the fees do vary depending on whether it's an international flight or a domestic flight then on the REITs, the kind of the real estate side anything that is in the airport that you know a business that wants to lease out space whether it be a restaurant whether it be one of those foreign exchange uh uh, booths that you have to go to, those are all rented out as space. And so those are the two primary revenue drivers for this business. It's it's pretty, I call it, you know, like I said, it's a combination of a public utility and a REIT at the same time. So there's two aspects of business that you really like. They're pretty stable revenue generators, despite what most people would think of as a very volatile industry, which is Mexican aviation. I don't um, if you've ever seen like Mexican uh, airway or uh, Mexican uh, airline companies, they you think American ones go bankrupt fast. You should watch the Mexican airline companies. But you know the actual airports themselves have been very stable revenue generators for a long time. The reason I wanted to focus on Southeast specifically is because they are the one that owns the Cancun airport, which it is the second largest or second busiest airport in Mexico behind Mexico City. And Mexico City uh, airport is wholly controlled by the government. They don't let anybody else touch that one. Uh, as the second largest, it gets a lot of international traffic, especially on the tourist side. So, you know, the, the fees that they generate relative to, you know, domestic flights is considerably better. And, uh, you know, there's a couple others in its portfolio. So such as Oaxaca, Veracruz, things like that. So they, uh, they have other tourist destinations as well, but they're a little, you know, because of Cancun, that's kind of the crown jewel of what they do. And it, because of that, maybe it's a little bit more tourist oriented, but again, international traffic, traffic that's really what matters here, at least for, in, from my perspective, in terms of how this business is going to perform and, and kind of the profitability of it. Um, on top of this, this operating model, they're actually now getting operating leases outside of Mexico as well. They've, they've taken on this operating model on several airports in uh, Colombia, and they've also taken over the one in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And so there might be this opportunity of growth where it can take operating leases from airports across Central and Latin America uh, as a growth lever at the same time. Now, like, it, it, all of this, it, it, it sounds good. There's a lot of growth. But one of the things that I do happen to like about it particularly is it's relatively modestly priced. It's trading for about 12 times earnings. It's a little bit more volatile uh, simply because of foreign exchange. So like your dividend right now, is it says about 6%, but because of the ups and downs between the US dollar and the Mexican peso, it's it's not like, you know, clock it in as exactly it's going to be this every single time. But at, with a 6% with a dividend yield trading 12 times earnings for what I think is a relatively stable business in a growing, robust economy uh, like Mexico today, it's really interesting to me and something I, I, I want to be involved in for quite some time. I own shares and I plan on owning it, even though they're only they're down like 10% this year. I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. The Motley Fool is a company that provides investing insight and stock recommendations for investors of all skill sets and risk levels. You all know how much I love researching new stocks and trying to find the next best investment. So I'm proud to partner with The Motley Fool to bring you 10 stock picks from the popular product Stock Advisor. Stock Advisor has beaten the market by nearly five times. So go to fool.com slash Frankel to get your 10 stock picks now. The Motley Fool Stock Advisor returns are 767% as of July 5th, 2024, and are measured against the S&P 500 returns of 163% as of July 5th, 2024.